hello to everyone watching. In case you didn't know, this is Venus Clap Back, the podcast dedicated to Black women's joy and liberation. And today is a special, special episode of our podcast. What you doing, Muse? I was saying, um... Me and my sister never part. My key da, da. It's so good to see you. Very good to see you, Coco. Very, very good to see you. I feel like <laughs> I haven't seen you in so long, and we just want to embrace you, my friend. <laughs> I embrace you back, my friend. <laughs> I, why was it so dramatic? We embrace you back. Um, but no, I think it's dramatic because we've been on quarantine. This is our first episode since the rise of the pandemic um, and all of the sheltering in place. Yeah. So this episode is a little different. If you venture back via venusclapback.com and see our past episodes, we usually record in like a studio environment. But, um, you know, we're just adjusting to the times. How have you been handling the, the pandemic? Um, it's been... It's been a, not really an adjustment because, uh, mm, yeah, not really an adjustment, mm -hmm. but an adjustment, if that makes okay. sense. It's like, um, like on the top end, I, I'm good being by myself. I'm a loner sometimes. Like, it's totally cool. But that's mm -hmm. my terms. Like, that's when I feel like not being bothered with people. Mm -hmm. Now that it's kind of, it's like this mandatory thing, I'm just like, <laughs> how much of a loner am I really? Because... <laughs> I want to see the world, and this is not it. So um, it's definitely had me in here on Google Flights, imagining where I could be, where I want to be, how much it's going to cost for me to get there. Uh -huh. But yeah, it's been a lot of uh, a lot of self-reflection happening, a lot of grounding. I feel like I've, I've grown quite a bit in this time. Um, it's definitely been trying my patience. Mm. Oh, Lord, it's been trying my patience. But um, I've, I've been able to get back into my bag of creativity, which has been really cool to see. Nice. I wasn't expecting that. Doing um, some painting. Yeah, yeah. Out, some yeah. Painting. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just sitting here bored. And then I was like, I have all these art supplies, so why not? And so um, painting and then, you know, people actually wanting it. I was like, oh, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't aware that that was a thing. So, um, I mean, obviously I was aware it was a thing, but not for me, you right. know. Right. Um, but yeah, it was, it's going well, as well as it can be. Me and my little dog baby, Ava, who's oh. now the door because she wants me to open it, but it's not going to happen. She had her, she had her chance. You gave her many chances. On me once. You are not. You <laughs> not do it again. <laughs> oh my gosh. But you know, these dogs have it good because they have been <laughs> all the, you know, family time with people stuck at home. Like and they love it. Super oh my goodness! Now. They loving it. Yes, absolutely. So how have you and Mr. Watson been? <laughs> Me and uh, producer Brian are holding up well. The, I think the pandemic has underscored for me the fact that I made a really good decision when I accepted his proposal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. showed up at the you know at the service that day to get married because um, he's just really refreshing to be around and. He, like any human beings, of course, we get on each other's nerves when you're together 24-7 now that we're both working from home. Right. But at the same time, we have, like, a good time. We we be in here watching documentaries, girl, talking shit. Well, you know. The I'm having y'all watch the family film festival. The ancient kingdom of Kush was <laughs> just going in, watching Henry Louis Gates documentaries. Right. Watching movies. Yep. The, the the family film festival is in full effect. We were watching Miss Juneteenth this week. We got to talking about Nicole Bahari Jones. Why doesn't she star in everything? Because she is amazing. She is um, great. And that's the kind of stuff, you know, that's going on around here. Uh so it's been it's been good to feel the strength of my marriage. Um and also it has been hard to feel the precarious hold I have on mental health. <laughs> but um, I was able to find a great therapist late last year who I could Wonderful. see. And she has been uh, incredible. So, yes. you know, the, the pandemic has been a mixed bag, but what are you going to do? You got to take it. Yeah. I've, been, I've been singing and getting into my creativity, kind of like you and your art. 
Uh, so I did, I was doing a lot of singing online at the beginning. Now I'm kind of like in the lab a little bit more, making new stuff and working on projects in the community. Wonderful. Speaking of- That's my friend. <laughs> 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 so we'll talk some more about those projects towards the end of the episode probably but speaking of in the community we had some amazing feedback recently that yeah. inspired me to try something new something new on venus clapback are you ready listeners are you ready muse are I'm you ready. ready something new a new segment for the first time ever on venus clapback and we call it clapback queens and we are going the to dancers talk. do this, so I'm gonna do this as my crown. Queens. I was listening to that song the other day, Janelle Monet. Yes. Um, so we wanna basically just highlight black women in films who are amazing. And I think for our very first clapback queen should be none other than someone you love, someone I love, Sheikah Gaines. Wonderful. Sheika recently shared with us some feedback about the show that just touched my core and made me just think again about how much she means to this community. She talked about how in her practice as a mental health professional, Venus Clapback has come up. She has heard our name from folks um, in expressing the impact we've had on their life and on our community. And that to me is one of the most powerful things anybody can ever hope for, anybody that creates can ever hope for. Like, yeah. I mean, how did that feel for you? It was, <laughs> again, I just being here by myself, chilling and I'm just scrolling. I was like, oh shit, this is, this is my name. This is <laughs> name. This is Venus Clapback's name. What did we do? Oh God, we haven't done anything in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, sometimes we kind of skew on a problematic side. So I didn't know what had happened. So um, we're not problematic. We tend to ruffle feathers. Depending on who you ask. Depending on who you ask. You're right about that. So um, I was reading it and I was just like, wow, you know, like we shouldn't take for granted the work that we do. Um, I know sometimes I can get caught minimalizing. Like, oh, I'm just talking to my friend Coco and some other black women and some other black people. And we just doing, you know, a couple of dope things in the, in the, in the community. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I would be remiss to say that um, those things are making like some real impact. And so for it to be on the lips of people that you and I may or may not ever meet mm -hmm. is tremendous um, and it's humbling and it's greatly appreciated. So I was very, very excited to read that and to see that. I think I put like a, about four or five uh, shocked gifts on the comment section. <laughs> like, oh my God, are you, you talking about us? Us, Louis? <laughs> So yeah, it was it was great to see and greatly appreciate it. And thank you so much, Sheikah, for that. That's that's really dope. Absolutely. So Sheikah, we wanted to show you that love right back and make sure that you know how appreciated you are. Um, so to tell our listeners a little bit more, Sheikah Gaines is an educator born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, and she moved to Arizona when she was 15 years old. So now she lives here in our community of Greater Phoenix, where the Muse and I are located. Um, and, you know, she has written a children's book called Janaira's First Day. And her book is all about helping motivate children to have the courage to honor their unique names, which we know is so vital uh, for Black children especially. She's also um, a mental health counseling professional, as we mentioned, and just does so much. She's also a storyteller who participated in our event, When I Fell in Love with Black Women. Last yeah. year, one of the most highly praised stories, you know, in our event, one of the most engaging and, and really one that I think helped people in the room turn a corner in their understanding of the harmful effects of respectability yeah. Or young black women trying to figure it out. Yes, yes. Um, so you really blessed our event. You have blessed this community. And <laughs> folks, if you want to learn more about Sheikah and her work, visit her online at SheikahTheAuthor.com. Sheikah is S H I K A, the author, A U T H O R, SheikahTheAuthor.com. Please give it up for our very first ever clap back queen, Sheikah Gaines. Woo! <laughs> Gots to love it. Gots to love yes, it. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
What are we gonna talk about, Muse? I mean, you know, lots of shit's been popping off in these. It's like, been popping, damn it. Yeah. And, um, a lot has to be discussed, sis. Lots of things have to be talked about and broken down. <laughs> so listeners might be surprised we haven't mentioned yet. Black Lives Matter. The uprisings. 2020 brought some things. It brought lots of things. And it was interesting to me. It, it's an interesting feeling for me because um, I think, like, for instance, Venus Clapback, we've always focused on Black lives. And in my other work, and I know Muse and your other work, that's always been central. But in 2020, with the uprising, it felt like a mass awakening to mm -hmm. sort of the type of work we were already doing and many other people were already doing. And so it was kind of a funny moment of how do I jump into this double dutch? Because I don't, right. don't want to be that person that's like, y'all late, you know, when you're talking about right. Black lives. Like, right, right, right. Um, but at the same time, I'm certainly not a person that is going to be out here um, putting myself on a pedestal as though I had it figured out because we know analysis is a lifelong journey. Mm -hmm. And so I was just, um, and then also facing a global health pandemic. So <laughs> I think for me personally, I've kind of, I've gone out when I could, when it felt safe and um, basically been trying to be a person that disseminates information. Yeah, and, and be a use our help our platform of Venus Clapback. I think we've tried to be like a a hub where people can find out what's going on with Black Lives Matter in Phoenix and Black liberation in the Phoenix area. But yeah. um, beyond that, I wasn't sure about how our show would address it. You know, because the thing is, um, this is a really important moment, and I didn't want to get it wrong. I'm not gonna lie, but yeah. I think that you know. Ultimately, we had to we had to say something. So here we are. How, I mean, how you been feeling, Muse? You know, um, in my self-reflective times here in my abode, I have been highly contemplating that double number of the year that we're mm -hmm. in, which is twenty twenty. Yes. And I'm not a numerologist or anything like that. I just know the common sense terms of what 2020 means as far as like going to the eye doctor and all the other kind of stuff, which, you know, 2020 is like, 2020 is like clear vision, better vision, able to see better. Hmm. And I feel like right now, 2020 is get, gutting up all the cataracts. Uh, <laughs> it's clearing the scales from their eyes. <laughs> it's clearing the scales from your eyes. Like, people, no, no, seriously, people are literally like, oh my God, I had no idea that these things were happening. How? Right. Right. Oh, did you not know? <laughs> and so I'm just like, these people are really like literally getting bifocals right now. Like y'all have literally been walking around here nearsighted and farsighted, damn near blind, voluntarily. <laughs> and now you want to get some glasses. Child, take that shit to lens crafters. But, <laughs> you know, it's good. It's <laughs> good that they are waking up. Yes. I just can't do the eye exam. Honey. Like, I can't, I, I'm not in that space to do it. Does that make sense? That makes all the sense. <laughs> I said long ago on Venus Clapback that I was divested from white conversations, but I think that that doesn't, there's still many conversations we need to have as black folks. Yeah. You know? And that's what we had, we've dedicated ourselves to as Venus Clapback. And so this, this moment very feel, very much feels like one in which a lot of white people are waking up. And so I wasn't sure what to do with that because what you just said, I'm not the one to conduct, you know, co to facilitate that. Right. But, but I am happy to see it because it changes the conditions for my people I love, yeah. for myself. Yeah. So, yeah. I will say this. My first and very last uh, white informative conversation, mm -hmm. um, I took a road trip up to Sedona. Okay. Um, just doing like some winery hopping or whatever and this white lady comes over and she's just like oh lord how, tell me what i can do to help oh she hit you with one of those we're raising our kids on the road we want them to see the world instead of being in school and you know they're eight and four i think that's what she was and then you know her husband was there and she's like, you know we're seeing everything and <laughs> we do how do we help and i was lit i was drunk so she got oh. me, uh, she got me on a soft day oh okay 
She didn't drop, drop me on a soft day. Okay. So I was, I was chill. I was zen. Okay. Got it. Got it. And so I gave, for, for me, my, my references is always to go to the arts, like the, mm -hmm. Clarks, the James Baldwin's, the Nikki Giovanni's, the three, um, oh my God. Uh, Nina Simone? Nina Simone. Um, not Terry McMillan, no. I mean, I mean uh, don't get me wrong. That, yes. might be, that might be 202, not 101. That's 202. That was what I was thinking about, but yes, her. You know. Oh, Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison, thank you. But just you like, how I, you like how I can read your mind, friend, right? You better be my friend. Yeah. I just took it back to controversial um, Black, Blackity Black uh -huh. art. Yeah. And I was like, let that be your lens, because art is going to tell you the truth, period. Black art's going to tell you the truth, period. I was like, it reading, you know, books and all that. So if you get to books and documentaries, great. But if you can uh -huh. go find these artists, start there, you'll be on the right track or whatever. And I was like, now I will close out this conversation with letting you know, I may be the first and last Black person that will give you this much energy on the education of where you need to start. Now, the next Black person you ask, they may tell you, fuck you, I'm going to do it now. Take that and be like, you know what? I apologize and move on. Don't be offended. Mm -hmm. This labor mm -hmm. in telling y'all mm -hmm. what we've been screaming since we've been here. Mm -hmm. So you've been getting the same message for 400 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say 399, because now all of a sudden in this year, you want to wake up. <laughs> you're hearing a new message a new story and it's nothing new you're now just deciding to listen mm -hmm. you can't I, I i told her very sincerely do not expect another black person to do this labor they're gonna they they may say fuck you and if mm -hmm. it's, don't take it you know mm -hmm. don't, don't make it a confrontation don't get into right. feelings don't pull a gun obligated to educate you mm -hmm. on what it means to to do what's right that's ultimately what I told her. I was like, you know, you know how you want your kids to be treated. I'm not really sure how much education you need around treating everybody else how you want your children to be treated. That's right. You know what I mean, like, yeah, yeah. that's right. So, yeah. now, you gave her the whole game. You gave her some resources and you let her know you was giving her a gift. So the, the Lord was pleased. It may not happen no more. The Lord was pleased with you that day because she needed to know that. I, I mean, was drinking all his juice. <laughs> I just, uh, I will say, if a white person has stumbled upon this podcast somehow by accident, their black friend left it up on the phone or on the laptop, I recommend to white folks, um, I would, you know, no white, only one white person came to me since the uprising started. Uh, and they just were like, could we have a phone call? And I was like, <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> but other than that, all the white folks in my life, the three of them are very well attuned to the fact that that is not how we roll yeah. as far as my labor. Um, if things come up in conversation organically and I share something, great. But I am not here to be your um, woke whisperer. Uh, that's other people's ministry. And I respect I respect Black people that choose to do that. It's like a woke whisperer. But it taints me. It taints me. Um, but uh, if a white person has stumbled upon this, I would recommend something that I have been watching and re-watching lately, which is the many different miniseries that PBS has put out um, by produced by Henry Louis Gates, the Harvard scholar. His mm -hmm. documentaries and miniseries do a really great job of sharing this really hard history, but also centering Black dignity. Um, you don't walk away feeling like, damn, I mean, yeah. Cotton. I never want to see cotton again, you know, or whatever. Like you get a, you get both. You get the tragedy and you get the nuance of all right. of the struggle and resistance that has taken place. I wish somebody would sit Kanye West down and tape his eyes open and make him watch these. Um, I just finished rewatching the African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross. It yeah. was really great. That gave you a lot of information about the various uprisings, including the Haitian Revolution, because the nice. black struggle is global. Um, and then so tonight, uh, well, the night that we're taping this, PBS is going to be putting out a new special by him called Reconstruction that I can't wait to watch. Because I think every time you see a big moment of Black uprising and progress, there is immediately a white lash. Mm -hmm. um, to use Van Jones' term, but don't see it for you, Van Jones. Anyway, um, that term, though, is so apt because after, you know, the enslaved people were freed, you had this Reconstruction 
we were getting elected, making gains, voting, and then boom, you had this rise of the Ku Klux Klan and lynchings, and then the, you know, at that time there was a big compromise in 1876, federal troops left the South, and that was it, mm -hmm. it all hell broke loose in the South. Um, and then what you saw 50 years later, excuse me, more like a century later, was the civil rights movement, and then you had voting rights acts, and all this legislation that changed our, our station in society, and then boom, you know, right after that, first of all, they, they assassinate Malcolm and Martin and Lumumba and different people, mm -hmm. and then next thing you know, there's this whole war on drugs, so-called, and our people end up in a situation of mass incarceration. Right. You get Obama, what did you get next? Trisna. So, you know, there's always a high water moment and then a white lash. And what I would love to see in this moment is that there's this black uprising that feels like it has a lot more non-black participation than ever before. And I would love to see those folks, those allies or people who are trying to be allied with us, make sure that that white lash don't happen this time. Can we just keep going up a little further, you know, and not have to get snapped back? Um, so... I hope that people will watch those historical references and, and help us to not repeat history. That's what I really mm -hmm. hope. That's my 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 uh, TED talk for the day. <laughs> we appreciate your uh, the more you know moments. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, it's funny. I find it funny that that person approached you uh, in Sedona. Do you think white people approach black men like that? I think white women do. Mm, say more. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Grand like, closing. I mean, I, I'd rather not spend a whole conversation talking about white folks, but um, definitely not. Um, yeah, I think I think white women approach black men that way. Asking um, for how to help and stuff like that. I mm, I think they just approach and and feel like they can say whatever. Mm, yeah. Um, now. They may have felt more, I don't know. Since she was like in her feelings, I guess she felt more comfortable asking a woman. Yeah. And like, so I don't know why she chose me. Lord knows, I don't know why. <laughs> Cause I'm sure she was not expecting that one-two punch at the end. But um, yeah, so I don't, I don't, I don't know why she, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it was destined. Cause like, girl, these little weepy tears ain't gonna hit every black woman the same. So get your shit together, go watch. She was crying, ew. Yeah, she was in her feelings. Go get, go hit Google. Like we Google for every every damn thing else. We go to Amazon for every damn thing. Like yeah. go, put, go put in the search engine, allyship, black people and the struggle. Like shit. Yeah. Watching it, if you're so moved to come and approach a black person about what's happening, mm -hmm. go Google the phrases you're seeing. <laughs> And do and, the research. And there's yeah. whole organizations out there dedicated to helping white people yeah. become anti-racist. There's a group exactly. called uh, Black People. Listen up, because I want you to have these on deck the next time a white person comes to you. Kindly redirect their ass to um, showing up for racial justice is what it's called. They refer to it for, for short as Surge, S-U-R-J. Send them right on over to Surge. Yeah. Um, there's another one. Oh, Indivisible. Mm. Send them right on over to the local chapter of Indivisible. They came around, I, I want to say sometime around the time of the Ferguson uprisings, maybe, no, maybe the Trump election. Child, I don't know, because it ain't for me. But send them right <laughs> on over to Indivisible. What was you about to say, Muse? I was going to say send them to, um, locally, send them mm. over to um, Inside Consultants. Yes. I don't know if it's still happening, but it's Monday through Friday. It's from 10 a.m. to 11, I think, or... Yeah, from 10 to 11, um, do white women care about black lives? Mm. And they hold a look, their own white people, and they have these transformational conversations. Send them over there, child. Yes, send them over there. We love let, let, the, let, the, let the ones, let the white folks who have done the work, <laughs> the real education and the real strategy and the real analysis, let them go talk to their people. We, we done. We're done. Are done. White I people. out. White people will now have to do their job. Well, hold on, let me backtrack. White people and white aligning people of color mm. to work to change this. Let them know. Let them know. I know some people like to fly under the radar, but I'm a, I'm a POC, that's cool. But, but 
<laughs> you're white aligning and you, let's not do that i don't aligning. i don't want to pick it apart because we're not going to pick apart within the community on right. the platform but you know what i'm talking about you know white aligning white passing that privilege is real and if you're not using it to disrupt oppression mm -hmm. then you just benefit um so yeah we love insight if you want to look them up y'all in the valley it's spelled i-n-s-i-t-e insight consulting but i asked that question muse because a lot of times i feel like people feel more comfortable coming to black women for labor mm. um, of all kinds um and i'm curious what listeners think you know y'all shout out in the comments what you think wherever you might be watching or listening to this but I honestly, at different times when I've been approached by white people in public for natural hair advice or <laughs> head wrap advice or who, who, who knows what else, I've thought to myself, this is so interesting because I don't think that you would approach a black man in this way. Well, here's because they're still men. Right. So there's a whole level of privilege that goes with that and intimidation and fear and whatever. So probably not in that same way. Mm -hmm the tea mm -hmm. i am serving it popping hot <laughs> oh serve it boo it's a gift and a curse mm -hmm. we get shit done mm. we have the answers we have the the journey we have the path we have the notes we have the research we have the know-how to do yeah then they're everything <laughs> so while it is probably smart on their behalf to come and ask a black woman, it's mm -hmm. disrespectful not to line it up with your coins. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Now, when you say line it up with your coins, what do you mean, Muse? You pay everybody else for their labor. Shit. I'm over here educating. People, people host classes on what to do with their hair. Your natural hair, your biracial hair, your um, how, to, how, to, you know, how to do your, your, your daughter's hair. Now, beauticians have a salon, sis. Go there. Go there. Ask random black women that you just see out on the street. Mm, 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 mm. Go to where you'll get the answers and pay those people to do that. But yeah. just asking, you know, me to give you a whole history of like what you can do to be a better ally, baby. Where were you in school? <laughs> the same time. It's true. Look at you. It's true. You know what I mean? Like, no, go, mm -mm, go pay up. And if you want somebody to, to labor for you, then you know, just be like, you know what? How much does it cost for your time? Can I get a consultation? Because I spent my time in the collegiate arena, <laughs> my books and writing my papers, mm -hmm. and indulging on my own personal time reading books and 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 being involved in in various communities to get a better understanding and an analysis and, and a lens to have these varying conversations. So I'm not doing that. <laughs> right, right. You don't just come and get the Cliff's notes from me. No, I know I got them. So you 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 chose the right one, but you didn't choose the right one. Cause it ain't. <laughs> you didn't bring your wallet. <laughs> you know, we don't ask, they don't ask Brene Brown to just show up and speak for free. Come on now. Shit that's just out here, gratitude and and self-resilience and shit. You don't ask Oprah to just show up for no. Nero Sandberg. No. <laughs> no, no, no. We're not doing that. Yes. So I think point number one for today's episode is stop exploiting black women. And when you said just now that I spent my collegiate time, you know, I'm so glad you said that because it brings me to my next point. Ooh, break it down. I got a shout out, a negative shout out, mm. a middle finger to somebody that I know some of the brothers love, that love and some of the sisters too love this person. Jermaine Cole, come on in here. Come on in here. Come on in the room. Rapper J. Cole. Come on in the room. <laughs> the man. He, just to keep it brief so we can talk about what really matters, Jermaine Cole, also known as J. Cole, is a I'm rapper. I'm that man, Jermaine. Because Jermaine is bugging. I had to. He's from North Carolina. I feel like if I ever met him, I'd talk to him like an auntie. Like, Jermaine. J Jermaine. Jermaine. Jermaine Trevon Cole. <laughs> boy. Boy. Get in here, boy. Because you, I'm talking, and when I say boy, I don't mean it disrespectfully. I'm talking to you like your, like your, 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 your black auntie would. Mm -hmm. So, Jermaine, you know, is respected and beloved 
by a lot of people who love hip hop. His music, it has like that calm intellectual sound to it. So people have assumed that he is a leader on issues of oppression and social justice. And he often is pictured out at protests. Mm-hmm. Even before these 2020 uprisings, he's been showing up, you know, since since before, right, through the years. So, you know, he's a voice. I don't know if that was his intention or not, but he certainly hasn't come out with any statements to the contrary. So when, as 2020 has unfolded, we got a whole global pandemic, not epidemic, pandemic. That means it's Money. everywhere. It's Ever. everywhere. Everywhere. We in the house, and then we get a video of Brother George Floyd being murdered in broad daylight, and people take to the streets. We haven't heard a song from J. Cole in a year or two, and (laughs) J. Cole comes back. And what he got to say? He spends a verse and a half talking about a Black woman who he doesn't name, who is coming too harsh at the brothers. And everybody listening to it knows that he's talking about no name. What were the lyrics? Because I don't be... Bro, you know what's funny? I'm pulling up right now because I was like, let me know what I'm talking about. The song is called Snow on the Bluff. I do know that. And I'm going to pull up the lyrics to share with you the part that was crazy. So he opens the song by saying, niggas be thinking I'm deep intelligent fooled by my college degree. My IQ is average. There's a young lady out there. She way smarter than me. I scrolled through her timeline in these wild times and I started to read. She mad at these crackers. She mad at these capitalists, mad at these murder police. That was a clue right there. If you know, he's talking about no name because she's talked a lot about anti-capitalism. Anyway. Mm -hmm. So he says, she mad at my niggas. She mad at our ignorance. She wear her heart on her sleeve. She mad at the celebrities and low key. I be thinking she's talking about me. Now I ain't no dummy to think I'm above criticism, but shit, it's something about the queen tone that's bothering me. She strike me as somebody blessed enough to grow up in a conscious environment with parents that know about the struggle for liberation and turn their provider with a perspective and awareness of the system and of unfairness that afflicts them. Just because you woke and I'm not, that shit ain't no reason to talk like you better than me. How you gonna lead when you attacking the very same niggas that really do need the shit that you saying? Instead of conveying you holier, come help us get up to speed. No. Jermaine. No. Jermaine. No. Jermaine. You were doing so well. You were stro- scrolling through her timeline, educating yourself and reading. And now here you come asking for another Black woman to do what? Labor for you. No. Labor. My progress to bring your ass up to par. What were you doing in your collegiate time? You wasn't reading shit? Like, come on. Come the fuck on. And now you want to police her tone because now you and your feelings, which nobody said she was talking about you. You took it upon yourself. To take it personally. Right. Step your shit up. You right. do that. Take that personal. Do your shit. <laughs> okay. And you know what? On the on the flip side, uh-huh. If come here, come here, J. Cole. If you just want to holler at no name, just holler at her. But you have to do this whole, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a hit her on her on her button that, that'll let her know that I like her. No, nah, motherfucker, mm-hmm. 2020. Mm-hmm. You ain't got to diss her on no shit either. So if you feeling her. And you feel like she bring a whole bunch of shit to your 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 empire because you know she could, and she's gonna bring you up to where you need to be consciously, or even as a man, fail. Hit her in the DM like every fucking body else, but you ain't have to do that. You ain't have to do that. Well, he got a whole baby and a woman at home. Oh, so. shit, no, but it yeah. probably is some undertones. That don't mean they don't you, settle in that way either. Honey, it's usually some level of fascination. Uh-huh. But then, let me give you some more views. Then he Shit. tweeted. That wasn't it. Damn. The next day, or that same day that the song came out, he tweeted. <laughs> so once people was like, oh, he talking about no name, and the whole thing went viral, he tweeted two tweets. Follow no name. I love and honor her as a leader in these times. She has done and is doing the reading and the listening and the learning on the path that she truly believes is the correct one for our people. Meanwhile, a nigga like me just be rapping. Then he replies to that tweet and says, this is the best part, Muse. This this might, hold your mule. All I'm going to say is hold your mule because this might take you to glory. He said, I haven't done a lot of reading and I don't feel well equipped as a leader in these times, but I do a lot of thinking and I appreciate her and others like her because they challenge my beliefs 
and feel that in these times, I, excuse me, and I feel that in these times, that's important. So why didn't you put that in your damn song? J. Cole, what are you talking about? J. Cole sent me to the roof, through the roof with this. He's trying to pull a white person's apology and it's not working for you, boo. Well, and the funny thing was, though, when you, if you went out on the Twitters, which I don't recommend, um, you know, the J. Cole stands was out. Like, y'all didn't listen to the whole song. Y'all don't understand. This man has a track record. He went to college just before he put his little tweet up. He went to college. He knows what he's talking about. J. Cole is for the people who is a no name. She ain't even got no fans. Just out here, just carrying that man's toilet water. And, you know, <laughs> Twitter is, but Twitter is a funny place. You got to be There's toilet water. <laughs> Because Twitter will have you thinking that the whole world is for or against something. And Twitter is like a very small percentage of the A drop in the bucket, yeah. yeah. Um, but it was so typical. It was so typical. It hurt. It was so typical. It made my stomach hurt. Like, how fucking basic can you be? You said she, she need to check her tone in 2020. But before we even get to, like, before, I'm not even going to get into that. Because to me, her comeback song, which is called... Um, uh, song 2030, I think. Let me see. Um, I'll get you that name in a second. But song 33. Thank you. Uh, song 33. Her song perfectly came back at him, and it was only like 90 seconds. She was like, look here, I ain't even gonna spend all day in the studio. Baby, it don't take long. But she made the point of that everyone was making on Twitter that they were, that was like, with well, everything happening in the world, this is what you put your lips together to do? J. Cole, the world is literally on fire. I think that same week they had burned down the police station in Minneapolis. Maybe. They done took over another police station in Seattle, then turned it into a damn music festival or something. Autonomous oh, yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, all kinds of things are happening. They're, up, they're pulling police out of schools, those ending those contracts, abolishing the police. That vote was starting in Minneapolis that week. Um, you're seeing people outing racists on their jobs, all kinds of change that didn't even seem possible two months ago is happening now. And white people are looking, they, they saw that video, they're disgusted, and they want to know what can we do? And J. Cole said, well, first, we can check these black women. Like, for real, J. Cole? Remember, what episode was that? We were talking about uh, it may be one of the unreleased episodes. So we were talking about movies and we were talking about Gabrielle Union's character. Mm -hmm. She's always like a, an amazingly beautiful, powerful black woman, black woman in these shows and these movies. Mm -hmm. And there's always this one black man love interest that just needs to bring her down just a notch, just to humanize her just a little bit. And I felt, I thought about that when you were reading through the lyrics and then how he tried to like, back pedal or forward pedal or like fall the fuck off the bike. I don't know what he was doing. Um, and it's just like, he just had to take his chance outside of his woman and his child and stay in solitude as he has been. He wants, I would just want to come out, you know, just, just bring it down a notch. Just mm -mm, come, come down a little bit, come, come down a little bit because, because you're serving us steak and potatoes and I'm still on the bottle. Like, can you just please, can you please, can you please spoon feed me some potato, please? No. Please, can you please put no. your hole in my mouth for me? No. Because my hands can't grasp it. Are you, are you nuts? Like, I'm talking to J. Cole. Like, are you, are you, are you out of your mind? No. It is two, it is the, the year of our Lord, 2020. 2020. And this? We're minding your business yeah. is free. It's always so, free. So I want to talk about No Name for a second because people sure. are not familiar with her. She I like her already. I'm not familiar with her, but I love that. I love her. The I name. Know. <laughs> and now I'm going to go pay attention to her. And yes. Can, let me, my phone, let me go follow her on the Twitter right now. Do it, girl. Because I only became familiar with her maybe last year. But, you know, her music is delivered very poetically. It has a spoken word vibe to it, although it's very rhythmic. So it's definitely rap. It's definitely hip hop. And she's from Chicago. Nice. She came up with 
Chance the Rapper. They went to the same after school program, which I found out when I looked her up uh, moons ago, and it was very inspiring to me. And it made me wonder what are the arts programs in Phoenix that mm. these kids could be connecting with each other in and building amazing new art. You know, it just it just underscored for me the importance of arts programs. But anyway, because mm -hmm. when you listen to her music, it's so full of depth. It's so creative. Her wordplay is mad skillful. And she took it beyond just the music and started a reading club, a book club. Yeah, I just followed that too. Yes. And I dare say that that is why J. Cole has a problem with her. Because she dared to go beyond just rippity rapping like him. Mm -hmm. And which is very valuable. But she also then decided to study, right? And then share what she has learned. And yeah. then help other people study too. But How this, dare she? And this is why I say I just hold allegiance to a black woman. That's that's. Let's just go ahead and put that out there. But that's why at, back at the top when we were bringing this in, I was saying you know it's probably under the right idea because we get shit done. Like we we are the shit. And so for her, it wasn't enough to just be like, all right, I know I'm gifted and talented in rapping. But how can I now bring my people with me? Yes. That's what black people, that's what black women do. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what black women do because it's by nature. And what happens is it gets exploited and manipulated and disrespected yes. by other people and black men. Yes. Now is what we're supposed to do. Right. And right. that's when you have now watered down. And, and we're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. It's what we're supposed to do. And we do yes. it wrong. Yes. Yes. Yeah, because we're not slow enough for them. But let a white person say to a black man, oh, your tone is too harsh, Mark Lamont Hill. Your tone is too harsh, uh, insert name here. And, you know, I can't receive what you have to say about black liberation. My tone is too harsh. You know, what about 400 years of oppression? What about lynching? What about job discrimination? What about wealth inequity? Et cetera, et cetera. And guess who was standing the gap for those black men when, that, when those white men would come? Guess. What would be your guess, Coco? Gabriel Union. Oh. <laughs> and, and what would she happen to be, Coco? Black. A black woman. Is that your final answer? Yes. Your damn skippy black woman with that. <laughs> and so, but on the, on the opposite side, you have motherfuckers like Terry Crews that want to answer questions that ain't nobody asking. Who asked? Nobody asked. Ain't nobody talking about no black supremacy. Nobody ever has. Nobody ever did. The world could only be so grateful that we're asking for equity, equality, and justice. Only be so grateful. And, 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 and be absolutely grateful unto God that we're not seeking revenge. Like, and it's a, and are you it's, serious? It's the lesson of Terry Crews and J. Cole for me. And what? Kanye West. J, J, Terry Crews, J. Cole, Kanye West, they are all in the same... Um, Iowa fried chicken bucket. Like, I don't even know what to call it. Some kind of coontastic <laughs> um, lunchbox. They all in it together because they are making statements and using their platforms in a way that is completely devoid of history, facts, perspective, and knowledge. Yes. Just, just, a, just, a, just a cursory glance at history would let you know that there has never been a time of black supremacy ever in term, and when you say supremacy you got to unpack that word because like crystal says words mean things words supremacy mean. means that there is a whole system in place that keeps a group in a position of superiority through wealth and access social order all of that and not only just keeps them in place but violently keeps them in place now there have been african kingdoms and there has been all kinds of greatness mm -hmm. there's never been a time in the world where white people were chained up by a global black race that's just not a thing right but most importantly because i know there are people that will argue that there were the moors and different things fine but in the united states of america and beyond that the western hemisphere has seen an african slave trade for centuries and then since then a white racial 
hierarchy that continues to this day. That is how you can see a George Floyd be suffocated to death for eight minutes on video. That's the a white racial hierarchy says that that is okay because a black life don't matter as much. So that's why black women, black queer women came up with the phrase black lives matter, not for supremacy, but so that we can stop being killed indiscretionately. I like to add, and it wasn't not, not knocking them or anything behind the creation of what they're doing, but the premise of the creation of Black Lives Matter was for the safety and protection of Black men's lives. Come and on. for you, not to say that, that was, it was, that's the total and complete message, but it was, it was sprung up. It was a catalyst. Yes. Uh, it was a catalyst, yes. So the fact that, and this is probably going to take us into other parts of protecting Black women and all this other stuff. So the fact that you fix your mouth to say anything, anything. the only persons that are overly qualified, dedicated, and sincere about the mission of keeping your Black ass alive, you choose to fix your mouth to say, check your tone. You choose to fix your, fix your mouth to say, help me keep up with you. You choose to fix your mouth to say that. It is such disrespect. It is such disrespect. And I, at this point in 2020, I would absolutely pay to be surprised at this point. <laughs> me too. I would, I would pay a good dime for that number of surprise. Me too. I want to be surprised, but now every time I see like, you know, a thread or a video or something, I just look at it and I'm just like. Typical. And then you <laughs> talked about, you know, black women's labor and being exploited. This is why, think situations like what J. Cole did is why you hear people say the phrase, black men are the white people of the black community. And I know that's hard for some folks to hear. Babe, right? I'm, and I'm gonna let you decide, I'm gonna let folks decide how they feel about the phrase. I'm just reporting from the streets. I'm reporting live. Just take it and um, replay the phrase a few times in your head <laughs> and how you feel first. And then we like, damn. And I said it, I've said, I've, <laughs> I've, been, I've been saying this phrase for a long time. Yeah. And friends are coming back like, hell, damn. Remember you said this like two, three years ago? Yes. Like, damn it. Yeah. Like, for real. Yeah. Yes. Because Black men are still men who still have privilege. Yes. And still exploit and use that privilege and wield that privilege of power. Yes. The same thing. And so when I think about J. Cole, the part that really, 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 really stuck out to me uh, from his verse and just the conversation that it sparked was the part where he said, um, she seemed like the type that was raised by parents who had, you know, knowledge or whatever. Um, that is the most, that is the most whack, weak cop out I have ever heard. And it, is my eyelash falling off? No. Okay. No. That cop out, <laughs> I'm going to tell you why it's a cop out. Because it's probably somebody that's listening like, well, he got a point. No, he don't. Because no, I would say probably 90% of people in this country who are black do not grow up in no household where the black radical revolutionary tradition is being taught. I certainly did not. I grew up with a very seriously pro-black mama. Yeah. You know, and yes, my mama went to college, but we wasn't in there reading Audre Lorde and James Brown and dissecting the Combahee River Collective and <laughs> figuring out, you know, and, and, and parsing the verses of, Nikki Giovanni, like, no, I came into contact with some stuff, sure. Yeah. But we study for ourselves. We study to this day. I'm sorry, <clears throat> my voice getting real high. But you know what I mean? It's <laughs> I just finished a 21-day Black History Month boot camp. Shout out to the people at the organization called Girl Trek. That's yeah. P-R-E-K. Yeah. I cannot recommend that boot camp highly enough. I mean, I can't say enough to recommend it is what I was trying to say. If you go to girltrek.com, you can sign up for it at any time. It's ongoing. You can start it any day. 
but it just starts from when you start and then it takes 21 days to finish. They email you every day. They send you a playlist to listen to as well as videos to watch or listen to on YouTube and reading. And each day- While you're walking. While you are walking, a 30 minute walk is what they want you to get in every day because they understand that self-care is a revolutionary act. It is. And I just finished and I learned so much. I learned about so many black women in history who fought for our freedom. And it's an ongoing journey. I'm about to sign up for something else next because I want to know, because when I go out here talking, I don't want to be talking out my ass, talking about slavery is a choice. Yeah. Like, oh. West. That's what, in case anybody's wondering why I brought up Kanye, that's why I brought him up because, you know, or, black, or we don't want Black Lives Matter to morph into Black Lives Better, which is what Terry Crews said. Well, obviously, no, no understanding of systemic oppression. I don't want to be the weak link in the streets. So I read. Now, I wasn't given this stuff on a silver golden spoon. I wasn't born with kente cloth wrapped around my head and held up to the sky like Simba or like uh, Kunta in Roots. I had to read. I read Roots when I was like 12. And I was like, no, actually I watched- big ass hardback books. <laughs> I was actually 10. And the only reason I know it was because I had my first ever black male teacher when I was 10, homeroom teacher in elementary school, Corey Roberts. Shout out to you wherever you are. I'll never forget you. He was amazing and he was pro-black. And I was like, oh, Mr. Roberts, he gonna like this. So I went to the library and checked out Roots and took it to school for show and tell. <laughs> Yo, yeah. I'm glad to watch it. And he was, I remember he was like, uh, Colette, we can't watch this in class, but thank you though. But thank you for bringing yeah. it. It's like a situation of where I read and I want to study for, for, you know, because I just want to know. And, and listen, not all of us have the privilege of the time to read, right? Sure, but sure. Google is free and Google available. Google is free. It's free. And it's available. And it's what? If there's something I don't know, and I, I learned from you a whole lot, child. Oh, right back at you. I don't know, I Google or I, I ask, and this is why you have circles of influence, right? Yes. So if you're not choosing the kinds of people that are gonna that you're gonna be around, mm -hmm. influence you in a way to where you know what? This is more so Coco slow. Let me ask Coco. And let, let yeah. me just default to Coco in this conversation because I don't got the I don't yeah. got the polish, you know? Yeah. It's, it's it's that kind of just take yourself off the pedestal. It's okay. You don't get to know everything. <laughs> you do not have to be the expert. Chill the fuck out. Like it's it's okay. It's right. okay. You'll be all right. You I know you're a rapper. Okay. And so humility is not necessarily in their DNA. So J. Cole could have made a song of questions. He could have made, made a song. <laughs> he could have made a song shouting out um black women who have led movements. He or he could have he stayed in the same vein of, damn, she's really challenging me, and dot, 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 dot. You didn't have to say shit about that girl. You have to say that. But the positive flip side of it is, I think a lot more people now are going to know about her, know who she is, because he has right. a way bigger following. Right. But, you know, the problem Which just speaks is... speaks way more volumes, because, again, her name is literally no name, so you don't, you don't even... She ain't even in the same circles as you, fam. So while you up here, why you worry about what the fuck I'm doing down here? Why are you here? Because he felt convicted and he knew he was wrong. Blue. But he ain't know how wrong he was. So I want to tell you how black men having the conversation, but you you find yourself more comfortable going and checking a black woman than than, than just getting your ass in line. Check. Anyway, go go ahead, girl. Listen, here's the problem: these men and these white people. They do sometimes consult, but they like to consult the same soft, mm -hmm. touch the feel of cotton ass mm -hmm. people who will reaffirm the worldview they already have. They already have. They watch the same YouTubers, Dr. Umar, we looking at you, who reaffirm a patriarchal heteronormative point of view that makes them feel comfortable on their throne. Ooh, Dr. Ooh. These white people will ask the same old, I ain't gonna name no names right now, but the same old G who makes them feel like, oh, well, that was bad, but it's not me. No, it's you. It's all of us. And they basically are, they don't have the courage to get uncomfortable. Right. And so when they do get uncomfortable, like Jermaine, 
they think somebody's doing something wrong. So I want to challenge any... Which is any, why mm -hmm. they're aligned with mm -hmm. the white people of the black community. Because yeah. if something happens that they don't like, they immediately become fragile. Mm -hmm. Same shit we see when we're having these racial conversations. Right. right. Like, go ahead, girl. No, no, no. You're right. Thank you for that. Because then they slide into our comments right and say not all white people or not all men if you feel in your if you feel um let me just say it this way to anybody listening that anybody right because we all have privilege i have privilege as a cisgender heterosexual woman um born in this country with my citizenship you know we all got all kinds of privilege but what yeah. i have learned is that if you hear something from an activist and it makes you uncomfortable what you don't do is go and challenge that person what right. you do is ask yourself now why did that make me uncomfortable mm -hmm. let me explore it why did that make me uncomfortable absolutely now you ain't got to agree with every activist i'm not saying that but study why something made you uncomfortable i've had times where a black activist said something that i didn't agree with i studied it thought about it some more and i still ain't agree with it and i don't to this day i'm thinking of a particular instance i'm not gonna get into it and then i've had times where an activist a person who doesn't walk in the same identities that I do said something and I felt uncomfortable and I thought about it and I was like, damn, that's my respectability conditioning showing mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. That's that black church brainwashing showing up. That's that Southern bell respectability showing up. I got to work on it. Let me get to working, you right. know, and it's okay. Right. It's right. okay to work when on it. When I found myself triggered, I'm, I'm a bit better now, but like even now, just some of the stuff I see, because now I'm just kind of in a space when I see black women posting things like let that black woman vent like let her get out it would have been out you know what I mean now if it's like some some silly stuff I may or may not have a comment or whatever or if it's like a, po a generically post conversation but if they're giving their experience and their opinion or their viewpoint on something mm -hmm. I'd agree with it but I just I just keep scrolling but I'm not here to silence her now come to me in my dm which happens sometimes like what do you think about my last post or what do you think about this or whatever whatever or i want to do this and and i'm like i you ain't got to run it by me for no damn approval that's for them that's number one right. and number two you know if if you're here for a reason and i have to hold you accountable for why you're wanting to post this like what what how will this you know impact the reader your readership or what are you really wanting to say how do you what are you wanting to do with that and if you're if how you want to put out put it out there aligns with your regular delivery your regular tone of voice and how you already communicate do that shit don't try to don't try to line it up and make it seem like it's an MLA format mm -hmm. hey, what's the only, still don't understand what the fuck that is you know right. what I mean? right. write shit out Say what you feel like you need to say and say fuck everybody else who ain't who ain't getting with it. Because the message is for those people who rock with you in your style, period. Whoever can get that can get that. Whoever can't, baby, they can slide in your DM or they can keep scrolling. Like that's that's how I feel. And so while I don't necessarily agree with everything that I see, it is also not my place to police another black woman on her experiences and her opinions. Right. Now, if you want to come to me and have a conversation about it, like I said, we can talk. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. I I don't mind agreeing or disagreeing or agreeing to disagree or disagree until we agree. I don't care. You know, <laughs> you know, we just having a conversation. Um, but I'm not going to but and I used to do like the, you know, holding people accountable like on their thread or whatever. And it's just kind of like, you know what? Let's just say her shit. Like she she mm -hmm. she she's an intelligent being. Mm -hmm. If she wants some assistance or some help or whatever. She know where to find it. She know where to find it. Yeah. And I trust that as a black woman, like I said, it, we know how to do pretty damn much everything. She knows how to seek out, you know, assistance for whatever she needs. So I'm not here to police her, you know, like, mm -mm. oh, don't say it like that. But again, that's that church, that's respectability shit. Don't say it like that. Don't put too many exclamation points. Don't do that. And I'll be reading them like, ah, ah, ah. and me shut the fuck up. Keep scrolling, put your phone down. No <laughs> shit. Let her live. Let her, Let her live. live. Let her live. So that's point number two from today's show. Let her live. And I'm a, I'm want to say that that is the point of this whole discussion. I think because you know it might seem like all fun and games when we.
talking about what's going viral or a song from a rapper or a beef between two rappers. That is not, though, the bottom line of all this. The bottom line of all this is that people are dying and that Black women are not only being subject to police violence, but they are subject to domestic violence. <sighs> and yeah. community violence and yeah. that is really the part that for me made it just devastatingly wrong what j cole did because not even i think a week before he put this song out a young sister named toyin was murdered was raped and murdered in florida and excuse me for not sharing a trigger warning but i'll make sure to put it in the caption um for this episode but Toyin, every sister has value inherently, right? Every human being does. And I think, though, one of the things that made Toyin's story makes it so heartbreaking is that she was an activist on the quote-unquote front lines in Florida. She had just led a Black Lives Matter protest of the killing of a transgender Black man named Tony McDade mm -hmm. down there in Florida. Um... Is it Orlando? No, I want to say I got a little bit. But um, I'll get the details and make sure I get that right. But she had just led a protest, y'all, against police brutality, as so many Black women do. When we talk about how people approach Black women for labor, it's not just about hairstyles and resources. We are the ones leading these dangerous marches. Yeah. Tallahassee, thank you. It was in Tallahassee, Florida, leading these dangerous marches and movements and direct actions. When you see somebody getting chained to the front of a police station or speaking out front at a march, more often than not, it's a Black woman. It's a Black woman who has organized it. It's a Black non-binary person who has organized it or is leading it. And we put our bodies on the line to save the lives of Black men and the entire Black community. And that's what Toyin was doing. And she found herself unhoused. Mm -hmm. And so she was staying at a church for shelter. And this black man approached her and said that he could help her. And he ended up sexually assaulting her. She tweeted about it. And within two days, she was murdered by him. He murdered her and a white woman at the same, well, you know, their bodies were found together. And so, the thing that is struck for me is that as Black women, where are we safe? Where are we protected? Maybe where? in death, because he buried mm -hmm. her outside. He left a white woman in her bed. Mm, I didn't know that. And there's just layers. The layers add up and continue. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, J. Cole, for releasing that song, especially in the time of, you know, the death of Tonyan and so many Black transgender women being killed. I think something like three Black transgender women were all killed in that same weekend. You know, J. Cole, that just really makes you trash, bruh. That makes you trash. And for you to redeem yourself, you're going to have to come some, like my grandma used to say down in South Carolina. You're going to really have to come some. You're going to have to come a long way, bruh. Um, I respect you. I even went to one of your concerts before. I won't be back. Damn. But more importantly than that, we as a community got to figure this shit out because the rate at which black transgender women are dying is frightening it is truly frightening and when you see videos of black transgender women being attacked and beaten in the black community it just is why for what and, and why to, to be absolutely clear these transgender black women are not dying at the hands of people within their relatable communities. They're dying at the hands of heterosexual mm -hmm. men, most often. Absolutely. I'm not saying that there's you know, other uh, issues and everything else, but same with, with Black women as well. This is happening in our community. And to go off on a uh, kind of a tangent, but not really, it's kind of still here, mm -hmm. with it's rampant killings and disregard for Black women's lives and our, our presence and our intelligence and what we, and our value and our, um, our proposition value mm -hmm. to the community. Um, there is, it, it's, it, it's very important to say, because I feel like Black people feel like they're invincible. And 
So, you know, like I said, I immerse myself in different conversations because I just like to know. I yeah. feel like, you know, we're everywhere. So I'm in uh, black, black people who have expatriated themselves from the United States conversations. They're living all over the place. And people who just love to travel the world, I'm in those conversations. And black people who are studying to be polyglots and they want to speak multiple languages. Like, just in many conversations. And so I'm in also this particular conversation mm -hmm. where there are black women that are coming to the consciousness of fuck y'all mm. on your own they're not interested in going to any more marches they're not interested in calling for no more justice for black men's lives they're not interested in um anything to do with black men because of the disregard for us and how large it is and I think it's important to say that because these marches and these movements and these organizations live and exist and breathe because of black women, because yeah. they care enough about your life to construct a whole global movement <laughs> for your existence. Yes. You are so caught up in your own male privilege. Mm -hmm. You don't see that black women are literally moving mountains and rivers to ensure that your life can be lived freely and justly and then for you to come and say some flippant shit about black supremacy some flippant shit about check your tone and you made me feel a certain kind of way or you know flippant shit about black women and how many baby daddies they got flippant shit about how black women wear their hair, flipping shit about black women's bodies after they're, they've given birth to your fucking children. You know, like everything that black women do is done so that it secures black men's lives. And that's how we're raised, like, let's just be honest. But on the contrary, I don't think that black men are getting the same message about our value um, about us. And quite frankly, I'm willing to challenge and let me know if I'm off base, and I would love to hear your, your, your commentary on it, if it's even safe to say, I don't, we, men in general, what we're talking about with our, within our community, mm -hmm. I don't think black men actually like women, black women. Mm. I don't think, because to like somebody, like I like you as my friend, Coco, so that means if you call me you, and, and you need me, I'm there, mm -hmm. I need some food, wash, whatever you need, you know what I mean? Like, I like you. And then I also love you as like my sister. So that means whatever the fuck we're about to do it, right? I I don't in in my life. <laughs> very few. Okay. I will I, I do have some some platonic male friends. Very mm -hmm. few, um outside of the possible opportunity to have sex with me. Mm -hmm have valued me mm -hmm. as a black woman mm -hmm. who attempt to date me mm -hmm. who recognize and see what i do and my opinions and my stance on things if they do come into connection with me they're they're somehow for some reason because i didn't do it they're intimidated for mm -hmm. the same reason j cole was intimidated mm -hmm. and um and then they have that little piece of like well let me well, you could have just, you could have done that better. You could, you could have done this. And it's not a critique. So I don't want nobody to come and tell myself, oh, she can't handle critique. I can handle criticism. But black women know what I'm talking about. And that's who we're talking about. Um, it's just that little, like that, that, that slight narcissism that tries to creep in every once in a while. Like, let me just bring her down just a notch. Cause you, you, you up there and I ain't up there yet. And I'm trying to slow down so you can bring me up there with you. Mm -mm -mm. Don't work. And I feel like, they don't like us enough to care enough to have a real conversation about, protect, about protecting us. And that's kind of where I'm at. I don't want to have any more discussions about it. I, I have it with you because you're another black woman and we can have a conversation. But to have a conversation with black men, not a lot of black men get it. Yeah. They don't get it. Um, and I'm not interested in, 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 in having the dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's really sad to see. It's really, really sad to see it. Um, for all the many reasons that I just just said, but it's it's not it's not um, it's not equal, and mm -hmm. there are black women who are like, oh, well, got shot in the street. That's bad. That's terrible. But what y'all eat for dinner? 
about to do. So I would really like for black men to sit and think like, what the fuck would y'all be doing with our black women? You can go and date who you want, procreate with who you want, but who, where would you be literally in all aspects of your life? Mm-hmm. A black woman. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, think about that shit before you go out here and, you know, declare your love and, and, and allegiance to some other shit. Yeah. Black women about to check the fuck out. And when, when, when we out, play, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know what you're going to do. I'm just telling you what's, what's out here in these streets. <laughs> Reporting live. Reporting live. She and Coco. Listen, Ooh. you said it best. And my thought on what you shared, you asked for my commentary as far as do they like us? When I think about Sister Tullian, her full name was Oluwa Tullian Salau. She was killed Saturday, June 6th, or her body was found June 6th. And 10 days later, J. Cole puts out this song. Let me tell you what I think about whether they like us. They, not only do they not like us, they don't value us. And in the few cases where they do, it's only for what we can do for them. And you touched on it when you said, you know, the thought of maybe being able to have sex with you. But it's not even just sex, it's sex. It's labor, it's stroking their ego, it's stroking mm-hmm. other things, it's access, yep. our skills and abilities, our intelligence. If we don't live our lives in a way that's centered on pouring into them, they don't like us. Nope. They don't think we have value. That's why you're single. That's why you're gonna never have about it. I mean, and you got too many degrees. You I read, treat me books. really well. I treat me really well. Really, really well. And because I just fussed at black at men and people in general for not having a historical grounding on what they have to say, I'm gonna tell you what the historical grounding is for that. They don't value us beyond what we can do because black women in the time of enslavement have more value mm. on the market. And Mr. Henry Louis Gates helped me remember that just a few days ago. Educate why do black women have more value on the market? Why do we go for more on the auction block? Because we were the ones whose bodies could bear more slaves. So we were in not only forced servitude, we were in reproductive servitude. Mm. The assault and rape of black women's bodies was part of the business model that built this country. Yes, yes, yes. And so our value became... And medical discoveries. Yeah, <laughs> all of it. So our identity became, what can we produce that will build and make, and make more value, material value for others? Yes. Not, no type of human value of our own. Mm-hmm. And that persists to this day. To where if you're speaking up for your views, your needs, your feelings, you out of line. Mm-hmm. Cause you human at that point. Yep. We don't want your humanity. What can you produce? Exactly. That's all. That's all. Many of them can see us as, even their exactly. own mothers and sisters. Um, and so that's what I think. I think a lot of them think they like us, but what they don't realize is that they only like us between two very narrow lines. Yes. And it it, it, it saddens me to even bring this up, but um, this is on Facebook. And I have to mention it because I find it to be very, very problematic, but it's a a black organization here. And the question was posed, um, why are there so many black women that are showing up to to enroll in these organizations, you know? And I was like, well, why can't the question be, why aren't black men showing up to enroll in these organizations? Why are you questioning the people that's coming? Mm. Why are you questioning why I'm I'm signing up? Again, black we we know that we need to save each other, right? Translated on the other side, and I don't know why. So then um, he came back and was discussing, you know, some other shit. His uh, and they be trying to break down history shit. Like I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Mm. <laughs> Can you answer my question? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Why aren't black men joining these organizations? Which I think is a very prominent question that a lot of movements need to be asking. Mm-hmm. Why are the black men in your shit? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And black men need to be asking, why aren't you there? Mm-hmm. And so um, he went on to say, and he just said it very 
casually like oh well you know um uh, well unfortunately what, what he said something along the lines of paraphrasing probably terribly but m more black women will probably have to die before black men start showing up to sign up for these organizations and these movements before they start to take it seriously and i said and black men are okay with black women dying so that they can live that's that's where we're at this is what you're saying as a community leader as a black organization community leader who's married with his own children you're okay with saying that out of your mouth that's crazy how you even came to that uh conclusion mm -hmm. that's the truth that we have to look forward to as black women divest is the only thing that we can do yeah live before us if, if we have to die so that black men can not 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 to not to take action but just to sign up for an organization mm -hmm. and if that's the if that's the messaging that is out here from an organizing collective here that's a fucking problem to me problem that's a problem to and me. so you know i so i, I know we got to take a break because we've been going right. at it and I, i'm sure you, we need to hydrate and moisturize <laughs> this shit. but i will say this when i hear that it just makes me realize that there are a lot of people that are lost and searching and they are getting guidance from people who are lost <laughs> and who are not you know grounded in the so much work that has already happened from our elders and our leaders who learn these lessons and we don't have to be doomed to repeat them if we just right. take a look back and get and get connected you know so when angela davis didn't write prison industrial complex you know 50 years ago to have to now be required to die in order for brothers to join the movement that's not Listen. that's not if you read it you'll understand that there's all kinds of other better paths so like i think what we can probably come back with is you know a few solutions in our next segment um i think one thing i want to answer is for the brothers who do want to know what can brothers do i want to explore that very briefly um and then i, I feel wanna, like that's the same conversation we have with white people though that's just kind of where i'm at listen i'm well i'm gonna give you the spoiler alert here's what they can do defund the police all right leave us alone i don't even i don't need you to do nothing for me quite honestly i'm i'm good i'm protected i'm gonna look out for me i'm seeking healing and we're gonna talk about that as yeah. well but we're going to talk about what is this movement even about and if you really want to help black women then join the movement god damn it i mean just join the movement follow black women's leadership don't feel the need to be the police of the black community and black women's thoughts you don't need to police our bodies or our thoughts for us all to get free you can get free without controlling me Did that yes <laughs> so good. that that starts in 2020 with understanding what defund the police means so we're going to talk a little bit, a bit about defunding the police and about what just really are the demands right now and what they mean because sometimes this stuff can is is a little bit harder to analyze when you don't interact with it every day and mm -hmm. we don't necessarily either but we follow some great movement folks who have helped us get informed and we want to share it and then um i do have though some tips for brothers who are trying to figure out how to live a life in which they are not trash. I have some tips, I do. So, you know, between a few little lifestyle tips and defunding the police, we're gonna help you out if you got the courage to listen. But more importantly, also, we're gonna uh, talk about black women just finding healing in these times, because there is still a pandemic going. Even the, the violence didn't stop because of the pandemic, obviously. Um, the racism didn't stop because of the pandemic. Right. And so we have to, in order to sustain, we gotta take care of ourselves. So we're gonna talk about that as well um, in this next segment, but first we're gonna take a quick break. But Muse, I just wanna give you a, a, a standing ovation because you laid it out, sis. Like, if y'all got any questions, just roll it back about two minutes and listen to what Muse had to say when it comes down to the community's relationships between Black people. Because we all we got, y'all. We are all we got. Literally. And if we can't get it together and not um, police and harm each other, it's going to be real hard to achieve a free world. So, ready for a break, Muse? Let's break. Before, yeah, break. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's going to start another conversation. <laughs> oh. We'll write it down, and we will talk about it in the second uh, second half. Is that cool? Yep. All right. We'll be right back, y'all. Venus clap back. 
I'm Coco. I'm your muse. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Venus Clapback, the welcome podcast. Back. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> the podcast dedicated to Black women's joy and liberation. Yay. So we had quite a conversation in the first half. Thank you for hanging in here with us. <laughs> My apologies for being long-winded, but it's... No! Are you kidding? I, first of all, I'm Black women are my passion, so I was just like, let me just get this out here, because these motherfuckers think they out here skating. Uh, floating on a memory. <laughs> and Black women about to be like, can't, can't, we out. <laughs> Yo, wake the fuck up. Shit. Oh my gosh, you were not long-winded. You were perfect, as <laughs> always. And then when we ended the segment, I said we would actually share some tips, believe it or not, um, with any brothers or allies who are trying to figure out what they can do. One question that's been circulating a lot in Greater Phoenix has been, how can Black men protect Black women? And I, Muse, I already told you this. I'm going to share with our listeners. I am over that question. I don't, I'm not looking for protection from anyone. Child, I'm beyond. Um, I've never, I've never, you know, <laughs> any protection I've ever felt has been from people who birthed me um or participated in making me i.e my parents and grandparents and relatives or very 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 close friends who became like family other than that you know i have definitely always felt more like prey than somebody that's protected and yeah. i had to protect myself so i think a better conversation than because i'm not expecting people to go from zero to 100 real quick yeah. i'm not expecting brothers to go from you know exploiting and targeting the women in closest proximity to them uh, um, and then suddenly be like oh but you know what I changed my mind I'm a protector now that's a that's a that's a big leap I ain't expecting that even though I'm a dreamer I'm not right. that big of a dreamer um, but I am knowing that there are things brothers can do to change the tide and to change the atmosphere and I want to share my thoughts on it and see if you have any thoughts Muse but before I do I, I think Muse you had a really great point that you were about to get into before we closed out could you share that point with people yeah, um, I know people, <laughs> I don't know why y'all do this. I don't know why y'all do this, but it's not cool. I know we are addressing lots of things in our Black conversation to our Black audience about um, what happens within our community. Yes, Because it's not to say that we're not dealing with Black-on-Black -black crime. It's not to say that we're not dealing with domestic violence. It's not to say that the community is not dealing with itself. What we're saying is, which I think which, which will transition over into it, there's no need to challenge Black Lives Matter on public platforms about what they're doing to ensure your Black ass stays alive. Handle the shit. The community is handling our shit. We're getting our shit together. But unification is something that we have to get on board with. Right now, BLM has the spotlight. If it ain't going to your liking, goddammit, email them, sign up, become a BLM organizer, and make it what you want it to be if it's a problem. But to be out here talking about some well, Black Lives Can't Matter until Black Lives Matter to Black people, what the fuck are you talking about, sir? People show up to your little cousin June Bug's funeral, don't they? It matters. <laughs> Stop doing this dumb shit now. And we want the community to handle it. Yes. With this performative posting and shit and conversations, <laughs> all these pick me conversations that you're having is just ridiculous. Okay? That's all I wanted to say. Black lives matter, period. Coup. Okay? That's all I had to say. Period, point, blank, coup. And I think that when people bring up that argument, it's so tired. And honestly, I've seen a lot of people jumping on it with the information that I need, and more so than in previous iterations. So I'm really very optimistic that this argument is going away and dying the death it needs to die. Okay. But black, when you when you say the phrase black on black crime, that's a false 
argument in and of itself because the way crime it works crime. in every community is just crime and communities are segregated. The United States has been segregated from the beginning to now, from the Ruta to the Tuta. Talk we about it. live in communities with our own race. Mm -hmm. So when crime happens, because it happens everywhere, uh, most likely it's going to be a situation where a white person kills a white person, an Asian person kills an Asian person, and a black person will more than likely kill a black person, because that's who's close by. People not really jumping on the bus to ride across town and kill somebody. Okay, they're killing who's nearby, they're robbing who's nearby, they're assaulting who's nearby, they're out here, they're hurting everybody. On top of that, they're not killing another black person because they're black. They're not killing another Asian person because they're Asian. They're not killing another black person because, like, just, just take a moment and take a deep breath and be like, let me get off of this fuck shit and actually breathe in some rational logic in this realm of thought that we're in right now like that that that's it doesn't make sense it really doesn't make sense if if the news hasn't told y'all enough if documentaries hasn't told y'all enough hell if youtube ain't told you enough it tells you not to trust statistics first and foremost and if you believe in the war uh on drugs within the black community, then you know that that is some trumped up statistical information that has gone out. Uh, why are y'all trying to make this two plus two equal 12? It is four, okay? <laughs> it is four. It Triple is math. And Triple math. The thing with statistics is anybody can twist any data to make it fit any narrative, right? Yes. So one thing they like to do is they like, like these trolls online, whether it be people in our community or, you know, outside our community, like to say things like, well, what about Chicago? Which, first of all, they got from Fox News. And, but anyway, the point being what News just said is that people are not being killed because they're Black, but people are in communities that have been historically, economically depressed. Yes. yes. You hear that word ghetto? That word was created during World War II because the Nazis forced Jewish people into small, you know, very uh, few blocks wide communities, took them from their homes, took them from their communities, forced them into these like tenements or whatever you want to call them before they carted them off to kill them. And those were called ghettos. There was a huge one in Warsaw, Poland. Um, look it up. That's where the word ghetto comes from. Black people didn't invent ghetto, right? Yeah, and absolutely. so the idea of a ghetto is that you take a group of people that you want to destroy and you put them in a very small, tight enclosure, also known as the trap. Yeah. Right? And so we thought we were, you know, taking something negative and making it positive by coming up with trap. There's no positivity to be found in this idea. So people will bring up the statistics that black people, we are more likely to die of violent crime. That is true. But that is not because we have a black on black crime problem. That is because we have a historical discrimination and inequality problem where we weren't able to go buy houses in other communities. We weren't able to get jobs and be supervisors. You know, there was a whole race riot in Michigan when Ford started trying to let black men be supervisors at the, in the auto industry, which was one of the surest paths to a middle-class life. We joined mm -hmm. the military, because that was another sure path to a middle-class life. When we came home and wore our uniforms and got lynched in the streets for it. So at as every- As soon as you got back fighting for a country. As soon as you got back, from every war, every war. Yeah. And so, you know, when you talk about black on black crime, get it right where the violence starts. The yes. violence starts with white supremacy yes. and has put us in a place to where our communities are desperate for opportunity and are trying to, you know, find a way, find some sort of support system and you get gangs, you know what I mean? And this is how the violence continues. It's not because we have some kind of predisposition to being more violent. That is, that, and when you, when you bring up black on black crime in response to our liberation movement, you yes. are feeding into the narrative that we are somehow more violent human beings. And that will never be true, ever. Uh, so I just think, you know. Because if that were true, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. America would look totally different if we were a violent people. Come on, we would have been if, 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 now, <laughs> this is this is just a theory this is just a theory i'm just throwing it out there because trayvon martin's killer is still alive 
gangs are also still alive and well. Mm. Not dead because we are not predisposed to be absolutely violent people. Like, let like, if you want to be real, that's right. I'm going to be absolutely honest. It's a lot of the the one of the guys that um, one of the cops that was involved with George Floyd's George Floyd's killing. One of the ones that was kind of standing by the biracial. Uh, guy, black guy, whoever it was, he was spotted at the grocery store and chick had caught him. And she was like, you think you can just grocery shop in peace? Mm. Like we're still in the middle, people are still protesting about you, sir. Mm. Now they're still protesting and you have been here by Oreo cookies. <laughs> Saw that. So these people, if, if, if we're talking about gangs being alive and well, these motherfuckers are out here at the grocery store living their best lives. Right. So if we're supposed to being absolutely violent, Baby, we wouldn't war we wouldn't care about defunding the police. We wouldn't care about rewriting policies. We wouldn't care about legislation. We wouldn't care about having black representatives. We wouldn't care about having black black congressmen. We wouldn't care about that shit. Cause guess what? You just be done on site. That's right. Terry Poo. <laughs> it's like Kimberly Jones said, the author in that viral video, she said, You better thank God that what we want is equality and not revenge. Uh, and so the last thing is that when you talk about police brutality versus this false narrative of black on black crime, at the end of the day, whether who, wh how many, however many of us are, you know, involved in violence, we are not drawing a salary from the state to commit it. And when black people commit violent acts against one another, we goes to jail, baby. Yeah. We be under the jail. Brothers, go, brothers got 50 year sentences for possessing an ounce of cocaine in the 80s and 90s. Yep. Okay? Black folks don't use drugs as much as white folks, but go to jail for it two to three times more. Absolutely. And, and that is statistically proven. And if somebody that's watching this is going to say, that's not true. Black people use more drugs. Look it up, baby. Look it up. But like we said, statistics don't prove everything. So just think about your life. When you want to really go out and get messed up, what do you call it? You call it white boy wasted. You call it white girl wasted. Okay? It's a reason that those phrases... Talk about the lingo. <laughs> Talk <laughs> about it. Everybody knows if you want to you want to turn up, you want to get high, you hang with the, you know, with the black folk. But if you want to get fucking wasted, man, you <laughs> hang out with the white folks. Because they got it. They got the cocaine. They got the pills. They got the drugs. Look up Valley of the Dolls. Valley of the Dolls is oh a movie God. that was made probably 30, 40 years ago now about white women taking pills in the suburbs. Taking, uh, you know, to cope with life. Look at us. There's a whole, uh, what's the show? It's an old, older show. Well, not that old. It was made in 2000. But it's called Weeds on HBO. Mm -hmm. Okay, I heard of Urban it. Mom became a whole drug mob boss. Like, yeah. Making peanut butter sandwiches in the day and then running the whole operation out of her shit. Y'all think this shit happens in the hood? No, the people in the hood get their shit from your neighbor. Come on. Shit. Come on. So it, it lets you know that all of, all of this stuff is propaganda designed to make you think that Black people are inferior and subhuman yeah. and more disposed to violence and drug abuse. But when you come into the 2020s, see, this is how the lie got unfolded, um, got revealed, because then we had a little thing called the heroin epidemic mm -hmm. rise last year. You know, you know uh, the no, opioid no, no, no. crisis. No, it's, op it's an opioid crisis. It's an opioid crisis. An opioid crisis. So we went from, we had crack and then there was a war on drugs. You had SWAT teams, you know, major um, assault rifles and, and cops breaking in and taking people to jail in droves for using drugs, possessing drugs. You got a little bit of weed in your pocket, you gone for uh -huh. years. But longer sentences than rape and murder. But then this decade, when white people become hooked on a drug called heroin, it becomes a public health issue. It's no longer about incarceration and punishment. So, you know, when you talk about black on black crime, what are you really talking about? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about us using drugs? Because baby, they use drugs way more than us. No, what you're talking about is a system that needs, wants an excuse to lock your ass up. So think about that next time you say the words black on black crime i didn't mean for us to talk about that that long but i'm glad we did no it's cool and again um uh, my black brother my black sister who's trying to um be on the opposite side of 
of justice and equity and equality for all of us black folk. Um, it still ain't gonna get you chose. Yes. It still ain't gonna get you chose. You can ask, and I'm gonna tell you how you're gonna get you chose, because you can ask some some black Harvard graduates, some black Stanford graduates, any other black people that went to an Ivy League, uh, black folks that have done, who are lawyers, who are also cops undercover otherwise, mm -hmm. still get discriminated against by the law. So take your little, take these statistics that you guys want to put together, because what they're not going to tell you is that they find some <laughs> some bumfuck town in Stanford, Connecticut, and they base their black statistics off of that shit. That's what they're not going to tell you. That's right. Because <laughs> you, when you when you read through statistics, I ain't no statistician or no nothing like that. But you have the fine print at the bottom, and it tells you all the little ways and means in which they went to collect this information. Am I right, Coco? That's right. It's, it's in very fine print, and when you start reading that shit, you like, well, damn, the population wasn't but ninety thousand anyway. That's right. Come on, people. Like, just, just, you know, just use a little logic. Just, just a little logic. And love yourself. See, love that's yourself. the key. That's the key. Because anything that I'm, nothing that I can read on the internet, and nothing I can read on Megan Thee Stallion's internet, nothing I can read <laughs> in anything her internet. <laughs> will ever convince me that I am less than anybody else. Amen. I don't care what it say. It might say, I might pick up a book and on the first page, the first line I might say, Colette is inferior to everyone. This has been scientifically proven. And it might list out the experiment and all of the um, proof and all of the historical reference. And I'm going to close that book and be like, well, that's a lie. Next, because I know what I know, what I know. Absolutely. Like Absolutely. Grandma taught me. You got to know what you know, what you know. So before you get into any website or argument or discussion, just yes, start loving yourself. Just try it. Indisputably. Put your right hand on your left shoulder, your left hand on your right shoulder, and squeeze for five seconds. Two, three, four, five, and let go. <sighs> and love yourself. Don't it feel good? Don't it feel good? So that's the first tip. We said we was going to give y'all some tips on how to do battle. Real quick, we're just going to run through a couple. That's the first tip. Love yourself. Run through. I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> no, you're not. No, you're not. First tip is love yourself. Second tip is, and the muse just touched on it, stop teaching and preaching respectability. Because, baby, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed in a full suit. Okay? So whether it be this stuff about pulling pants up or short skirts or using slang or going out and, and doing something with your life, that's great. Teach people to do something with their life. But don't teach them that these silly superficialities going to keep them alive. Because and he was shot while still being nonviolent. He still died. Because even in nonviolence, you think we're violent. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So let these kids express themselves. Let these women live. Like we said, let, earlier, let her live. Let. And stop going out here teaching this false narrative that somehow if we achieve the highest levels of anything, it will end racism. What will end racism is when white people stop being racist. So take that finger that you like to wag at people in our community and turn it to the whites because they're usually to the left oh, and to the right. <laughs> oh, you said turn it up. Okay, that's fine too. Whatever you need to do. But I'll take it back. turn it I away from me. No, no, no. <laughs> No, don't put the finger put the finger away you know what i'm saying yeah it's just so silly the whole tone policing thing we talked about in the first segment mm -hmm. all of that is respectability trying to tell a black woman well if you say it like this well if you say it here if you say it there nigga this is not a dr it. seuss film <laughs> she it don't it. matter let people live their truth let people be queer <laughs> let people be transgender let people live um, the third tip that I have specifically for black men, because that first one was for any and everybody, those first couple, but this one's for black men. I'm going to call it untrash your circle. That means um, if you, 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 y'all, some of y'all like to say, I don't know who these men are. Yes, you do. You see them in the barbershop. 
you um, see them at work, you sit around, you laugh at their jokes, you know, you kick back and you click on their videos and you think that it's okay because you don't think the same thing. First of all, they're influencing your ass. So yes. they're trashing, trashifying you with every second you spend in their presence. And then secondly, they're never going to change their behavior because they know people like you will support them. <laughs> Heartedly, with your whole heart, honey. Muse, you said something when we were chit chatting the other day. You said uh, that they need to link up with who? I don't remember. <laughs> she just be dropping gems. That <laughs> don't even. It just you just gotta catch them, y'all. When the muse drop a gem, you got to catch it. She said, you said that black men need to link up with other black men who are loving black women in a radical way. Yeah, I did. See. <laughs> Yes, because it's one thing to be like, oh, yeah, my homeboys, they all married, blah, blah, baby, that wife got a different story to tell. I ain't, just because folks marry, I don't give a fuck. They may not be in love, or he could be in pure hell. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in you just being around people who are just married for the sake of being married, baby. They don't, they don't move me. It don't phase me. It, it holds no accolades for me. I need you to be around black men who radically love black women, period with through the lens of i want nothing but the best for black women it has nothing to do with me or my penis or my feelings or being romantic if you develop some love in there and you find you a black woman and you want to love her radically baby do your thing right Fuck those kudos okay but um now nah, you got to change your circle and i'm gonna tell you it's gonna be hard for you to find some other radically black loving uh, black women loving black men because everybody wants to be on some I love all women shit these days. If you want to do better, you got to try hard to find it. Black women do because they still fighting trying to trying to find where the black men at today child's ass. So do just the same, fight just as hard, work just as hard, search just as hard to find other men that align with your train of thought and what kind of what you're trying to build and do with another black woman. Find them people. Mm -hmm. They're gonna set you on the right path. Now, them people may not have a a a, 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 a squeaky clean past. Mm. Some shit that you can learn from. Mm. That's some shit you can. I, you know what? Another thing. <laughs> uh, he's a black man that radically loves black women. Um, he's out of. He's in New Orleans, but um, he told me that he started to appreciate. He better to better appreciate um, his relationships <clears throat> with women when he started taking care of plants. Because plants require, like, it's it, different plants require different things. Hello. Mm -hmm. and so you have to make sure the soil is right. You got to make sure your plant to get in the right thing. <laughs> the foundation, basically. Yeah. Oh, you got to make sure the seed is there. You got to make sure it's growing right. You got to make sure it's getting enough water, enough light okay. to grow. Uh -huh. And leave it the fuck alone. I mean, and so he was, you know, he, he tells that to other guys as well. But I, I, I get you a plant. If, if that's the most practical thing that I can give you, get a fucking plant. And really sit down and think about what it takes into having a successful plant. And then apply those same tips to your platonic or romantic relationships. That's, that's, that's all I got because I'm tired of trying to help folks out. But go ahead. <laughs> I feel like we could honestly end the show right there because that was such a word. <laughs> honestly, like that is that is it right there. And there's a movement right now of black people gardening, black people growing food and yeah. food sovereignty. And I think that it's a beautiful thing because caring for plants, caring for the earth brings out your tenderness. Yeah. And this is the thing, tenderness is the thing that white supremacy has robbed us of as Absolutely. black people. Yeah. Black women and black men. It has robbed us of access to our tenderness, to our femininity. Um, we frown on femininity. That's why you have all these issues. It's femphobia. That's what it is at the end of the day, whether you want to call it, you know, misogynoir, sexism, you know, chauvinism. It is just basically a fear of femininity and a hatred of femininity. Whereas a plant, you know, is going to do what a plant want to do. 
you can water it. You can do all kinds of things. But there are going to be days where you just cannot control what that plant decided to do. That one leaf might be brown. It might be yellow. It might have white stripes because it just felt like doing it that day. And I love that analogy because that's the, the grace we need to extend to Black women. We have this idea that Black women got to operate within like these narrow definitions of like these Madonnas right um when i say madonna i mean like the virgin mary you got to either be the virgin mm-hmm. mary or you a full hoe and there's no in between and no nuance for us but they want both <laughs> they want both <laughs> at the same time and when you think about the, the tenderness that's required and the detail that's required to cultivate and love and and keep a plant alive i love that it, it, it's like you have to allow for the full range of who someone is i love that thank you for sharing that I think that's really, you know, the only thing I would add to our list then is, so how do you spot a radically Black woman loving Black man? To me, it's a couple things. It's somebody that has that tenderness. Mm -hmm. And then it's somebody that's giving a sister a break. Literally. Yes, Lord. Hiring Black women. And not just hiring Black women, but saying, I'm hiring Black women. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Promoting and paying Black women. Paying Black women. Paying black women. Paying hey. black women. Girl, say what's hot. Paying black women. Hallelujah. That is radical. That is radical and revolutionary. And, and is. that is loving. You know, because those resources that you pour into us can save our lives. Um, of course, you know, choosing black women romantically. But that one, that's not really high on the list for me. Because there's a whole lot of slave owners that chose black women. Oh, for sure. For sure. To reproduce with. So being attracted to us don't mean shit. But someone who has chosen to build a life partnership with a black woman, that, you know, that, that that's an indicator. If, if it happens, fine. Right. But... Grow your pants. <laughs> shit. <laughs> and then the last one I would just say is a lot of times, like Ebony said, people are in partnerships and we, you know, go hashtag black love, hashtag goals. And it's actually quite the opposite in reality because we don't know what's happening in their house. Listen. A truly, you know, a black man who's truly radically loving black women is one that's giving a sister a break. And that means, you know, let a sister have some time off. Not being tied up in this idea that a black woman's value is her labor and what she's doing, you know, at the house and for the kids and all these things. Just making let her have space for her humanity and not being all up in her grill every moment with your needs. So when I go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say there's a way to figure out which side of the coin you're on if you're a black man. If you think mm-hmm. about if I say if I ask the question, why do you love black women? And the first thing that comes to your mind is how strong she is. You're part of the problem. You're the woman to break. You got some undoing to do, brother. You got some undoing to do. She's more than just bearing <laughs> trials and tribulations. And, and the list is so world. terrible. When people answer that question, go on Twitter and see some of the answers to that question. They'll be like, I love black women. And they, and, they, and they go in on it and they think they're doing something poetic. I love the black woman because she's the strongest being on earth. She can carry the load of the entire community. And that's she what slave masters thought too. Man. Man. That's what she wants? Her scars go deep, and yet her love is strong. No, I don't want a scar. I want to be smooth and brown. I don't want to. I don't want to be scarred up for you. That's just not sexy. Scarred. It's not sexy. It's not sexy. I sent out like this little questionnaire for my friends to fill out uh, a couple weeks ago, and the first one is, I think the first question was like, "Who is Ebony?" And so the, the responses that I got back was like all these other beautiful, beautiful, beautiful adjectives. And I let it go that day. And then the next day I went back to rereading and I was like, and I sent the message. I was like, you know what? I have to give y'all props. Neither one of you called me strong. And I appreciate you so much for that shit. Like I am so much more than just, Ugh, I can have my opinions and I'm, you're going to hear me when I'm speaking and gotta, gotta, I'm so much more than that. Like this, this is what people get when you ask me my opinion. Sure. <laughs> I am some, I, I won't say totally different. I'm still the same Ebony, but there are so many layers to me, you know, that a lot of people don't get a chance to experience that they kind of stop at my opinions and they don't get to see the full width and breadth of me being a whole black woman, you know? So it's, it's just, if, if your first thought is, I love black women because they're strong or strength or um, historically or... <laughs> resilient no oh, god they can they they uh they birthed my children that's still like la- that's literal labor <laughs> don't 
love us for our labor. Just love us. Like, damn. Can you try it? Love yourself. Love about it. And then love us. Hey, Lord have mercy. Well, I think brothers, I think people respond, because and women say it too. Um, I think we say that. I think that's about, whole brand language. It is. That's what I was about to say. It's yeah. autopilot. It ain't nothing but autopilot. It's autopilot, yes, yes, yes. It's a script that we are taught that we pick up on and repeat, rinse and repeat for generations. Like you said, it goes back to slavery time. And that's the thing that if, before we close out today's show that we really wanted to leave folks with is that it's time to, 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 to use some 90s slang to flip the script. Mm-hmm. It's time to undo the programming and get off autopilot. And one of the major ways we live on autopilot as Black women is that we basically design our days in service to others. And listen, service is great. Service is, what's the quote? The rent that you pay for being on earth, I think. That's great. Uh, but <laughs> I think it's maybe Shirley Chisholm said it, somebody. Somebody have been. But that's awesome. I believe in community service. But listen, we do service by definition as Black women. There ain't a time where somebody asks you for some food, you don't get them to help them get something to eat. When you out and about and there's somebody that is, you know, asking for money or looking for help, you can, I've noticed this. I can be in a park a lot with 25 people. And if I'm the only black woman, they're coming to me first because everybody in this society knows that a black woman will more than likely help. Not every black woman, but everybody right. knows that more than likely a black woman is going to help. That's why you got all these hashtags, trust black women, black girl magic. Everybody knows we do service. So, and I'm, I'm listen, I'm part of Delta City Theta, and we are all about service. We are right. a public service organization. And there's nothing and wrong with that. By definition, that is what we do. Yeah, so I believe in it. And, because multiple things can be true, the Muse and I, I think, both have realized in our life journeys, you tell me if I'm speaking for you correctly, that living your life in autopilot where everything you do is for other people is a real quick way to burn out harm a lot of pain Mm -hmm. never attending to your own needs and what a couple things made me realize it y'all know that i've um you know gone through some things in the last year or two but even before that i realized that first of all my health was failing me but even before that i well in the process of trying to figure out my health i realized i would go to the doctor and the doctor would say well where does it hurt or you know where is the pain and i would or where have you been hurting and i would say I don't know mm. because I was, I am that oftentimes still even because I'm still on the journey that mm. disconnected from my own body yeah. to where I don't even really know what my symptoms were because I've been going to work every day. I don't know when the pain started. I don't know when the swelling started. It's here now. Can you give me a pill and send me on my way? <laughs> right. oh. <laughs> that is not what we need. You know, what yeah. we need is to have the space to breathe. Mm-hmm. When I say give a sister a break, yes, I want you to pay and, and, and compensate and support and respect and advocate for um, and even physically protect Black women. But give a sister a break also means just let a sister breathe. Mm-hmm. And, and when I say breathe, I mean deep breathe, like meditation. Right. I mean, I don't know if you identify with that feeling of disconnection from yourself, though, Muse. I like, totally, you know. totally, totally agree. And again, like, it's, it's the years of root of Christianity, religion, like it's so compounded. Mm-hmm. So, we're, you know, we're supposed to live a life of service to others, and, and it just leaves us completely um, clueless as to what to do with ourselves. Like, how do I get here? And so, it was a while ago when I just started adapting, like, when after I left the church, honestly, um, where I just kind of adopted the, man, the mindset of like, get you some silence, like, just get all the noise out. Like, what are your thoughts? Like, even to the point, and I think I mentioned this on one of our episodes, um, because even as I was coming out of going to church a lot, I was still listening to gospel music, you know, for worship and Mm -hmm. other kind of stuff. And then, I, you know, it even got to the point where I was like, this isn't even my worship. Like, do I know how to worship God by myself, on my own, without the help of John P. Key or Church Franklin or, you know, you know what I mean? Like, it's not my worship. That's their worship experience. I'm, I'm partaking in their worship experience. Like, how do I usher in God, the spirit, or whoever, you know, you guys may, may, may choose to worship? How do I usher him in by myself, for myself? And I had to listen to myself 
Because if you believe what the scripture says, I am, I'm a, ref- I'm a reflection of him. So how do I get connected back to myself? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, have to, I need to listen to myself. Yeah. And how do I now honor myself as I'm honoring God? Because I am, I am God. And you can contest it. It's scientific proven. So you can take that with your scientists. Bill, not the science guy, if you want to. But um, I am God. I am a black woman. So how do I now honor myself? You know what I mean? How do I listen to myself? Mm-hmm. Honor myself, and um, it's it's an ongoing journey because. You know, it's just, it's so many things at play all at the same time, but we do ourselves a disservice when we don't, I'm going to say it, and then I'll explain it. We do ourselves a disservice when we don't listen to God. Again, with the, with, if you have the belief that you are created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. So if you're not listening to God, you're not listening to yourself. That's, that's kind of how I feel. I agree. And I think that when you break it down to practical application in your everyday life, the lack of uh, space to listen to yourself has dire and continuing consequences. Because then you're operating from where? From autopilot, yes, but from trauma, from unexpressed pain, from repressed feelings, Mm -hmm. um, and just outside of yourself. And so, of course, you're going to be angry. Then they call us angry Black women. Of course we're angry. Right. Of course, we are carrying generations of trauma. My great, 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 great grandmother likely had her babies snatched away from her and sold down the river literally to the deep south for brutal Mm. bondage. I'm carrying her tears in me. Scientifically, it's been proven that epigenetics is the feel of studying how generational trauma is passed physically in our genes. Absolutely. So of course we have. Mm -hmm. Like if if you're to bear children, even down to the eggs, it's already been in your grandmother's life. Cause you're all, you already have all the eggs you'll ever have. That's right. Period. (laughs) So those eggs have already lived a, a whole life. Right. You know, and so it literally is, passed down like literally i read somewhere that there's a point and i need to look it up and share the link where your grandmother you and your mother are all present together on a cellular Mm. level in the Mm. world there is a point in time in the reproductive process in the um developmental process wow and it's just powerful to think about and so you know we're carrying these past traumas and the new ones that get added on day to day Mm-hmm. And then we go out here and we get new ones because we lead in these movements. And we on the front lines putting ourselves on the line. And yet we continue to do it because we are people of survival, right? And because we have hope. And we don't want to lose that hope. I'm not, I don't want Venus, I don't want you to walk away from Venus clapback like, well, you know, first of all, fuck these black men and ain't no hope for the future. <laughs> that's yeah, not no, what it's not, not, it's not. you to walk away with. You know, we are, I consider myself an Afrofuturist. You know, um, Octavia Butler it, to me is a psychic, but um, definitely a person who helped us to understand that you got to look to the future to understand as part of your fight. And yeah. for me, look, and I read actually something as part of the Black History Month boot camp, not, not Black History Month, Black History boot camp that I was just talking about in the first half. I was reading one of her articles and she said, you know, the act of even looking to the future is an act of hope, right? Um, and so whether, you know, whether you have a, a good, I, whether what you see is positive or negative, because there are a lot of negative things we're talking about today, but we, Venus Clapback, we are trying to figure it out because right. we love us. We love ourselves and we love our people. So when we critique, you know, Black men and Black women, and when we talk about Black lives, queer lives, non-binary lives, transgender lives, we're talking about our family. And trying to heal our family. But you can't heal your family if you don't heal yourself. And you don't heal yourself because you're healing your family. Heal yourself because you have value. Period. Your value has nothing to do with what you're going to do for somebody else. Absolutely. And what I learned about trying to, you know, trying to to parse through all of the trauma and pain that I carry um, was that it starts with a lifestyle of mindfulness. Which, let me tell you, I'm from Columbia, South Carolina, originally from Georgetown, South Carolina. I ain't know nothing about no mindfulness growing up. What no yoga? Yoga? Who is yoga? Yogi the bear? 
Didn't know nothing about it. <laughs> I knew yoga either, bear, but I didn't know nothing about yoga and these different things. But, you know, what you're seeing, I think now is like um, a, a wide scale awakening um, of not even awakening, but awareness where black people are embracing mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness is just being intentional about your thoughts. Right. Intentionally steering your thoughts, not just regurgitating the stuff you got fed, you know, these girls out here fast, you know, things, things that just get said real flippantly, like Ebony, excuse me, Muse just gave a whole list of flippant remarks earlier in the episode, not just repeating what you've been told, but having taken a moment and mm -hmm. being intentional and not only about what you say, but what about what you think, because thoughts become things. And so I learned like, instead of sort of just going through my day, I need to stop and I need to feel, first of all, what is my body feeling? Mm -hmm. how, how does my stomach feel? How do my feet feel? Do I, can I feel the ground beneath my feet? Yeah, yeah. Can I take a deep breath? Can I do another one? And when I take that deep breath, what am I thinking about? I need a mantra. Maybe yeah. today's mantra is abundance and that everything I need, I have. And so I don't go out into the world being desperate for stuff that ain't meant for me. Right, right. All of, and all of these things are part of mindfulness and the practices within mindfulness, which is things like yoga, meditation. There's a Japanese art of hand healing called Reiki, mm -hmm. Tai Chi, deep breathing. But above all in my book is counseling mm. and therapy. Yep. And the idea that you're going to go and get some professional help with disrupting your negative thoughts and behaviors because sometimes your mind just be going it's just going do, 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 do. lord knows mine does right um i'm a gemini but anyway but <laughs> what a therapist can do is help you to say okay so when i start thinking down that rabbit hole here's what i'm gonna do to reroute my thoughts and mm -hmm. when i start doing this destructive behavior where I'm, you know, dependent on this activity to get me through, or I go and seek this out to make me feel valuable. Instead of doing that, here's another thing that I can do. And they right. give you tools to navigate. But we don't do that stuff. A lot of us, many more of us are starting to, but a lot of us, especially people in communities like the ones me and the Muse are from in the South, right? Middle class, working class, poor, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. People in our communities do not access these services as much. Why? Why do you think, Muse? Well, I think it goes into the... Well, I'm from the country, so... <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily a matter of funding. It's just, it's just country as hell. <laughs> and, you know, far, far removed from, like, city-like activities or whatever. But I think for the most part, if we're talking about, like, inner cities where, where there is funding that is somehow rotating around the necessary community centers, mm -hmm. I think it's a matter of, um, you know, making the community aware of the opportunities and resources that are there for them, right? And yeah. we know that they can go there and play basketball. We know that they can go there and um, play um, table hockey or whatever, you know what I mean? But, like, what else can they do? Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many other things that are happening that, no, not that are happening. Because, again, none of this shit is new. We're just now being put on game. Yeah. Um, these things have been in practice for a very, very long time. And so I think it just, it, it's a matter of, you know, when people are funding these um, community programs, funding schools, funding whatever they have, music education, all of those things, um, those are missed opportunities to allow our our babies, kids, youth, teens, young adults, adults to experience new things. Mm -hmm. Money is then turned to then fund the powers that be that are out here, you know, heavily policing them, which ultimately is counterproductive in my opinion. So um, I think it's a matter of funding mm -hmm. for the most part, because you know, us country kids, we're just resourceful as hell. We find anything. That... <laughs> but as far as like the more modern uh, ways of handling and dealing with things, I think it's just a matter of, you know, equity. Mm -hmm. Especially what you can do, where you can be, um, who can provide these things, where's the funding going to be. I think um, there was a school program I was looking at and instead of detention, 
they put the kids in, in, in meditation. Mm -hmm. Just simple changes, you know what I mean? Because some, like you were saying for autopilot, for some kids who are living really tough situations and experiences, fighting is autopilot. Like that is, that's, that's as easy as breathing. You know what I mean? And there isn't anything else that's being introduced, like you were saying, as a way to cope with that previous behavior. Not calling that behavior bad because you got there for a reason and you needed to do it. That's how we're created, you know? Yes. Um, but other things, other opportunities need to be introduced to us as a community, mm -hmm. even as we're getting older, you know, as a new way of being, a new way of life that other people have had years and years ahead of us of, of being able to get to that. Absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly. And I think I want to be careful too, to not blame black folks. Right. No, because no, 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 no. I think that for me, it's fun. It's, it is those outside resources that come into those communities and yeah. rip out what's already, what's already there. And that's not to say that it's not already established in black communities. That's what I was about to say. But the funding again is so misappropriated that those programs can't live so that's that's kind of where i was going from so i'm sorry that is definitely no 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 no, no. Okay. I, was saying, I wanted to make sure that it was understood that i wasn't blaming black people when i talked okay. about our lifestyles oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, especially with this coronavirus you see that a lot um people talking about our lifestyles being the reason that we're disproportionately affected um but when i'm talking about autopilot so no i wasn't addressing what you were saying at all i was just okay. tagging on to say I don't want people to think that this whole autopilot life and like sort of living in service to others is like some kind of um, pathology that black people have where we're wrong for doing it. It's not that. It's just saying that life is traumatic. When you live mm -hmm. in a capitalist society where everybody's expected to work, 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 work until you die. And that is supposed to be your value and the line on your headstone that, <laughs> you know, life is going to be traumatic in that sense. But here's yeah. the thing. Capitalism is not, is not, um, Capitalism, there was a world before capitalism. And when you look at the practices of our ancestors, yes. indigenous ancestors, right? Because we're all indigenous somewhere. So think mm -hmm. about where we're indigenous to, you know what I mean? Right, right, and then right. the people indigenous to this land that we're on, the native peoples of North America, you know, there those cultures, there was there were think there were activities like meditation. It might it might not have been called meditation, right? right. But right. the act of connecting with the land, the tribal ceremonies, you know, that took place, the different ways that people maybe worshipped spirit or connected with themselves bodily, even the ways that sex and love and courting took place. Mm -hmm. All of that had a much more, in, much more of an intentionality to it before right. you have like, you know, a capitalist system come along that basically makes you feel like anything, if it ain't about them dollars, it ain't got no value. You know, that's like, that, that's basically how that translates. And so when, when we're talking about these things, you got to first of all understand that, you know, this mindfulness is as old as the world itself. And that there are things even in our culture today as black people in America that, that are, that have mindfulness in them if we just access it that way. When you talk, when you pray at church and everybody closes their eyes and bows their heads, mm -hmm. that's a moment for, of deep breathing and intentionality and focusing, everybody's focusing on a message. That's a right. mantra basically, right. you know? But the thing is that the way we do it oftentimes is very rigid and, mm -hmm. we, and what one man or one person has interpreted as the way and what we're supposed to do. So the right. point, like, like the muse just said so elegantly, you know, is about how do I worship? How do, how do I even, you know, what is mine without the assistance of anybody else? And the same thing goes when we be talking about these other holistic health alternatives. Mm -hmm. but one of the biggest problems to me, like you mentioned resources, I think that's number one. And right there with it, another problem for me, I think, is cultural taboo. Mm. I think that for a lot of us being raised in um, Black church or other Christian environments, we get made to feel like if it ain't in the church house or in the Bible, it ain't right. It's evil, matter of fact. Not just not right, but it's of the devil. And so you got people that think if you do yoga, that means you worship in Buddha or some Hindu God or, you know, something that feels at odds with Christianity. 
um, people, or also Islam, right? There's a lot of the same respectability in all those different religions. Every religion has respectability issues. Right, right, right. Um, and you got people that make you feel like, you know, if you're trying to do Reiki, then you call it forth evil spirits or something like that. When that, when that Reiki is nothing but channeling the energy that already exists inside your body. Right. Um, right. So I think for me, my hope is that people will seek out, um, will, will, will feel open and flexible and tender enough to seek out healing in um, new places and new paths and to help, especially the black women in their lives do that. And I have done that. I will say I have gotten, I've gotten a lot more into yoga and a lot more into meditation and it has saved my life because the traumas that I've experienced throughout life and especially in the last couple of years, had me hanging on by a thread yeah. and I find now that when I engage with those things I'm still not as deep into it as I want to be but when I go get me a yoga session with Moonchild Yoga uh Kiara Boy shout out located in Phoenix Arizona when I go get me a good private class in because we're still in the pandemic <laughs> I feel so much better I know how I feel first of all and my therapist said to me also a black woman I'm not gonna say her name because I don't want y'all to my business but uh and she ain't taking new clients anyway because that's how dope she is but she said to me as I was engaging in my grief process she said you know sometimes you just need to go out take that walk or do that meditation she was like because you're spending so much time mourning you're depriving yourself of the opportunity to remember Mm. remember mm. your mama remember the good times and the joy and the lessons that she taught you but when right. you're constantly in that state of pain and anger and overwhelm there's no space yeah. for the parents to come in and sure enough i went out and got my little butt to hiking and walking and deep breathing and things i hadn't thought about in years started coming back to me i just started hearing my mom and my aunts and my uncle all their voices in my head because I've lost three immediate family members in the last 12 months. It is, a, it is a difficult time. And for y'all listening to us, you are in a pandemic. You may have lost somebody to police violence. You may have lost somebody to coronavirus. You got to take a moment. You got to stop what you're doing every day. And the pandemic already showed us it's possible to completely change your day-to-day -day routine. Yes, it is. And now how can you infuse that healing into it? And that's, you know, that I feel like that is the message that I hope people can take from what we're saying today, whether it's stopping the cycle of exploitation of black women, stopping your participation in that cycle, stopping the narratives, the false narratives about our people, interrupting racism, or most of all, just giving yourself a break to connect with some healing. Yes. So this is what this time is calling us to do. Absolutely. That was... That was butter, honey. That was butter. <laughs> that was butter. Um, and nutrition, yeah. you know? It's, like, we had um, Living Pharmacy, Medina on. Go Medina. check that episode out. He, food can be our medicine. There's just so many ways we can heal ourselves that don't involve going to the doctor, because we yeah. know the healthcare system is biased, right? That don't necessarily involve leaning on a pastor or a preacher, because we know that that's, they're human just like us. Yes. Um, and if that's where you get your support, that's great. But I'm just saying we can investigate other modalities, nutrition, you know, breath work, all of that. Just get back to the to the, to, to yourself. Get back to the center. You know, center. find those simple joys, those simple moments of peace. Like mm -hmm. saying, you know, before about how I'm making it through the pandemic, like. I hadn't myself like actually painted anything in a really long time. Mm. An arts business. <laughs> and I, I was too afraid to even create anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of people see me as like fearless and fierce and you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. lots of things, and I know this to be true about other black women as well, because I'm a black woman. Mm -hmm. Lots of things that we are very, very tender about, very sensitive about, very, you know a lot of things that are close to our, to our hearts. And as my other, you know, prolific black woman sister friend had said, Erica Badu, you know, I'm sensitive about my shit. <laughs> so I wasn't putting out my artwork. I wasn't telling anybody that I created anything or I could paint. I'm still struggling with the word artist, hell. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's just giving yourself the, the permission. Like don't wait for other people to give you permission. Give yourself the permission to feel how you want to feel, do what you want to do. Yes. Where you want to be. 
You know what I mean? If it's if it's respectability politics, is do your thing in your cardigan and your ankle length neck um, skirt. <laughs> That's right. Wrap it up. Do, wrap yourself up. Do. Whatever you need to do. If you want to be in between that and be just kind of like conservative and free or boho or whatever, do your thing. If it's an OnlyFans page, baby, get your money. I'm not here to judge you because I ain't got to pay your bills. You do. Do your thing. I'm not here to judge you. But give yourself permission to be free in what in, in how you envision your life and how you envision freedom for your life. I'll say that. Yes. Whatever that is, be cool with it. It's okay. It's okay. It's all right. It's okay. And, and listen, we know it's hard. We know it's hard. Like we 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 know we know that it can be hard. But honestly, sis, it's not as hard as it sounds. You all it is is flipping that switch and saying no. Just some that's shit really, you don't want to really do. Hard. <laughs> Say no to some shit you don't want to do. You coming to work Saying tomorrow? No. Nope. Hard. No. <laughs> you go. Did you do the laundry? Nope. Oh. Mom, you gonna do my project for me? Nope. No. <laughs> you can figure it out. I'm taking the day. I'm getting a facial. I'm going to let someone rub oils onto my face. Well, it's a pandemic. Yeah. I'm going to buy a mask from the store. I'm gonna have it delivered and I'm going to put a mask on my face and I'm gonna lay back and think thoughts. I'm gonna concentrate on what I want from my life. Mm -hmm. And y'all, before we go, the last note I want to leave y'all with is so when we say defund the police, all we're saying is take the money from the, the guns and the tanks and the billy clubs and the tear gas and rubber bullets. And these useless ass cameras because they're not even believing what they're watching. And put it toward a world where everybody can get a damn break. Whether it be a job, a safe place to go after school, a safe refuge from an abusive situation, some education, some yoga, some meditation. Think about how, how different our communities would be if we funded all this healing that we, the music and I just talked about instead of police. And when I say instead of, I mean instead of. Because police for right now, for instance, right now in Phoenix, the city council just passed a budget where the police, I believe, get over $750 million for this next year. 12 months, $750 million. With a homeless problem. <laughs> a serious homeless problem. Not enough beds. They closed down almost all the public um, facilities for people who are homeless. So they don't have nearly enough shelter beds, and we in a damn pandemic. And that's what they did. If they would have just took two of the millions, just two, 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 two of the millions, the 750 millions, just two, just two of they them. could open up an amazing shelter. There's so many um, empty, abandoned, abandoned buildings, <laughs> buildings, abandoned hotels in this yes. city that they yes. could convert with one of the millions. So it's really, defund the police isn't just about shut the police down, we hate the police. It's about reimagining life in this community. Yes. yes. And that's what the Muse and I are talking about. Reimagining your life in the direction of healing. Well, defunding the police means reimagining the community in the direction of healing. So that's what people are out here fighting for. That's what sisters are out here reading about. It ain't a new idea. It's just new to the mass consciousness. And if y'all give us a break, I think we can get there. I really think we can get free. Really? So the first thing it's going to take is for y'all to give us a break and for white people to get fucking real. Well, on that note, <laughs> on that note I'm on Venus Clapback. <laughs> I'm Coco. And I am your muse. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, we're so happy you're here. <laughs> And please follow us on Instagram and Facebook yes. at Venus Clapback because the revolution will not be televised, but it will be digital. It will definitely be digital. I like that little closing. Yes. Thank you, Muse. I like you. <laughs> All right, y'all. Well, we will see you next time right here on Venus Clapback. Bye. <laughs> Don't take this the wrong way I don't need to be said